welcome to this virtual geology field trip around Flamborough Head, Yorkshire's Great White Cape, which is just north of the seaside resort and small fishing port of Bridlington. The headland provides Great Britain's most northerly coastal exposures of the Upper Cretaceous Chalk Group and is capped by Pleistocene tills and fluvioglacial sediments. Pointers and other types of indicator will be used throughout the presentation to demonstrate the important features at the localities visited. And when appropriate, there'll be reviews of the relevant stratigraphy. Because there is so much to see, the excursion is presented in four parts. And in this first part, we'll start at the cliffs below the village of Speeton and work our way eastwards up the stratigraphic column to Scale Nab or Staple Nook, which is on the RSPB reserve on Bempton Cliffs. This map shows the topography of Flamborough Head and the three localities which we shall visit in this part. Essentially, we are examining the highest part of the north side of the headland that overlooks Filey Bay. You'll notice that the cliffs rise to over 100 metres above sea level at Buckton in the northwest, but they fall to between 25 and 49 metres by the time we reach the access points for the localities further east that will be visited in parts two and three. The lowest cliff sections between South Landing and just beyond Sewerby will be covered in part four. So after a check of the tide timetables, it's on with the virtual hard hats for the start of our trip at Speeton Cliffs, which is accessed by a long walk along the beach from Reeton, or a steep descent of the cliff from Speeton Village. From there, we'll move to the high vertical cliffs at Bempton, home to England's only mainland gannet colony, and the site of the RSPB Bempton Cliffs Reserve. A walk along the cliff top path on the reserve will bring us to Staple Nook and its breathtaking surprise. At Speeton, if you can drag yourself past the outcrops of the Lower Cretaceous Speeton clay, so loved by Professor Peter Rawson seen here on the left of the picture, we find the base of the Red Chalk or Hunstanton formation, which is also of Lower Cretaceous age, and immediately precedes the chalk group in Northern England. The full thickness of the Hunstanton formation here is about 20 metres and it consists of alternating beds of red mudstone, limestone and clay with a rich belemnite fauna. Small forms of the Tethian genus Neohibolites are particularly common and for those more familiar with the stratigraphy of southern England, the occurrence of Neohibolites minimus shows that the Hunstanton formation is, at least in part, coeval with the Galt formation. Further along the beach, the junction with the overlying Ferriby formation of the chalk group can be examined. Note the nodular nature of the beds that come down to beach level and the darker units above that mark the top of the Hunstanton formation. This is England's only section that provides an exposure of a continuous boundary between the Upper Albion and Lower Senomanian about 100 million years ago. As the main focus of this first part of the tour is the chalk group, it may be worth pausing at this point to appreciate the conditions controlling chalk deposition and to consider its general stratigraphy in Northern England. Chalk is largely composed of the remains of tiny planktonic organisms called coccolithophores, which accumulated in a marine environment almost continually for 40 million years and over a vast area of the Northern Hemisphere. Over Britain, sea depths were probably up to 300 metres above present day sea level, 
with mean surface temperatures of 25 to 30 degrees C and atmospheric CO2 levels at four times those of today. Sedimentation probably occurred in pulses, resulting in a rhythmicity to chalk bedding, almost certainly controlled by the major Milankovitch frequencies of 21, 40 and 100,000 years. The whole sequence of the Ferriby chalk formation, about 25 to 30 metres of thinly bedded chalk marl couplets with no flint, can be seen in the Speaton to Buckton cliff sections though they're not easily accessed for close examination. Lithostratigraphic correlation of the Ferriby formation relies on recognition of three or four marker horizons. Chris Jeans recognized a group of six similarly thick chalk bands, which emphasize the rhythmic pattern of this formation. And there is a harder, gritty textured band called the Tottenhoe stone, which often contains well-preserved fossil echinoids and bivalves. About 20 metres above the base is the pink band, and above that, the black band, a complex of mudstone, silty chalk and dark clay up to 50 centimetres thick. It represents an oceanic anoxic extinction event, OAE2, or the Bonarelli event, and it marks the Cenomanian Turonian boundary about 94 million years ago, as well as the junction between the Ferriby and overlying Welton formations. Examination of fallen blocks at the foot of the cliff provides a microcosm of the geology of Flamborough Head. This large flint, the hammer is 35 centimeters long, is typical of the type referred to as paramudra, an annulus of flint with a core of hardened chalk, which is believed to be that of a burrow of an informal organism, sometimes referred to as Bathycnus paramudra. They first appear in Turonian chalks of the Burnham chalk formation, about 90 metres above the beach level at Speeton. This fallen block is of calcrete, sands and gravels cemented by leached calcium carbonate in an arid or semi-arid environment. This is from the Pleistocene deposits, which blanket the chalk, and we shall come across other examples on our journey around Flamborough Head, notably in part four. Our second location is the RSPB reserve at Bempton Cliffs. It's accessible by car from the village of Bempton, along Cliff Lane, which crosses east-west to line the ridge ridges of glacial till, deposited by Devensian ice about 20,000 years ago. And our final locality in this part, Staple Nook, is at the eastern end of the reserve, where we'll make a magical transfer to a conveniently positioned small boat to give us a different perspective of the cliffs. The visitor center has monitors streaming live bird action from selected sites on the reserve and has good catering facilities. A free information leaflet produced by the Yorkshire Geological Society for the RSPB outlining the geology of the reserve is available at the information desk. This map is taken from that information booklet. Our route will take us from the Seabird Centre to the viewing platforms at Grandstand and New Roll-Up, and then along the clifftop path to Staple Nook. Close to Grandstand, the path overlooks a narrow gully incised into the cliff. Note here the relatively thin cover of till, about four to five metres thick, and the difference in profile of the chalk and till faces. This is a reflection of the way in which each of those materials is eroded. The inlet is a possible collapsed blowhole. Air trapped within caves and open joints within the chalk was compressed by the force of the sea until it found an exit at the top of the cliff through a network of weaknesses provided by the rock's joints and bedding planes. 
In this particular case, the roof of the feature has collapsed. Other examples will be visited in part three. The reserve has a number of purpose-built viewing platforms that provide excellent views of the cliffs. At some, it's possible to appreciate the surrounding geography and geomorphology, as well as the wealth of bird life. Looking southeastwards from the viewing platform at New Rollup, two important and closely related features are clearly visible. The cliffs at Bempton are significantly higher than those towards the eastern end of Flamborough Head. And the Pleistocene deposits are thinner and at a higher, about 85 metres, base level. A ridge of glacial material can be seen a short distance inland from the cliffs. New Rollup also provides a view of Bempton's elephant, a sea arch resulting from marine erosion of the blocky chalk cliff. You can spot his trunk, his eye, and in the summer, the top of his head is a prime site for breeding gannets. From New Rollup, we're going to walk round and past Stapplenook to a point overlooking the small cove beyond the elephant. But before we do so, let's revisit our stratigraphy of the chalk group. We examined the Ferriby chalk formation at Speeton, and we saw the base of the Welton formation. Notice that the flints of the Welton chalk tend to be nodular, whereas those of the younger Burnham chalk formation are more tabular. This view from between New Rollup and Staple Nook shows cliffs with clear lines of flint. These, together with softer marl bands, provide the ledges on which the seabirds perch and nest. And this cliff section, as seen from the Staple Nook platform, also provides a view of the chalk with its distinctive flint bands. Which of the formations can we see in these cliffs? The flint is dominated by continuous sheets along bedding planes and these are referred to as tabular flints. So the chalk here is in the Burnham chalk formation. The flints in this face also appear to be carious or imperfect, a feature that will be investigated in part two. But they first appear in the late Turonian and continue into the Coniacian chalks. Note also the precarious nature of the block of chalk directly above the two tabular starred flint bands and which is occupied by the sole puffin. It demonstrates the way in which the chalk cliffs wear away, block by block. On the final leg of part one, we pass through a gate where a hard black rock has been used to form a set of durable steps. On the seaward side of the fence, just before the gate is reached, there are one or two boulders of the same material. They're dolerite erratics, transported by Devensian ice from either the Cleveland Dyke of North Yorkshire or the Wind Sill of County Durham and Northumberland. At our final locality, we can see the other side of the elephant, and on a good day, it affords a look back in time to the Jurassic world of North Yorkshire. Filey Brig is visible across the expanse of Filey Bay. And when the conditions are favourable, it's possible to make out Scarborough Castle and beyond Scarborough, the Tabular Hills. If you're really lucky, you may be be able to make out Haven Wyke, which is just south of Ravenscar. But what, what is more impressive here is a 200 metre long belt 
of chalk strata, where we witness intense deformation. This is one of two or three major lines of contortion that cut across Flamborough Head and are believed to have been generated by reactivation of faults of the Hawardian Hills complex. Another example will be visited in part three. Virtual field trips provide the leader with magical powers. So we'll transfer to a boat waiting at the foot of the cliffs and take a better look at these contorted chalk beds at Staple Nook. Folding has produced a syncline and subsequent marine erosion has sculpted this stunning curved bedding plane. Close by, we can recognize a corresponding anticline and several interesting associated features. There's a fault. There are tight V-shaped folds. There are caves excavated into the cores of these folds. And there are complex collapse structures, possibly the result of thrust faulting. I hope you've enjoyed this opening to the tour of Flamborough Head, in which we visited the Hunstanton Formation and the base of the Chalk Group at Speeton. And there we viewed the full succession of the Ferryby Formation up to the Black Band and its boundary with the Welton Formation. Because of the height of Bempton Cliffs, we climbed the stratigraphic sequence to the Burnham Chalk Formation, characterized by its courses of massive tabular flint. And we began to notice the Pleistocene deposits, deposits that will become increasingly complex and important in later parts of the tour. In part two, we'll continue along the north coast to Thornick Bay and North Landing, both of which allow easy access to beach level and where we can study exposures either side of the Welton Burnham Chalk Formations boundary and consider variations in flint form.